Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service online only today. And uh, we're uh, thankful that you are going to be joining with us. And we're going to ahead and get started. Looks like we're maybe one minute early, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get started right now. Uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, we're uh, certainly looking forward to the opportunity for us to be back together. We miss you, miss every one of you, and uh, we hope to be able to return to service together very soon. Uh, there'll be no prayer meeting again Monday night, no in-house Bible study Wednesday night, though we will be online at 7 o'clock. Thursday night, Riverbend Recovery will be announced at a later date, just as soon as we figure out the, the uh, logistics of it. Uh, next Sunday is also to be determined. It's possible that we could have service in-house next Sunday. We'll be in contact with you and let you know that. Uh, we will have uh, devotions that will be available on Tuesday and Thursday at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we'll be giving you some more information during that time. Uh, again, trunk or treat is canceled. Not going to be any uh, trunk or treat this year. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, you'd like to send them in via the comments. Please feel free to do that. We want to pray for those that are sick from the virus and otherwise. We want to remember uh, Rodney York, who's in the hospital. And uh, uh, thankfully, all of the attenders of our church, those we worship together who have gotten the virus or have been able to stay out of the hospital. We have some that are already out of quarantine and ready to go back to work. Some have already went back to work. And so the Lord has really been good to us through this time, and we're grateful for his uh, uh, protecting hand. I want to pray for our church. That when we come back together, we'll pick up right where we left off as far as momentum and growth. And uh, we uh, probably won't have Sunday school for a couple of weeks, but then we'll get right back into that again as we were earlier. Um, we uh, want to pray for our country. We want to pray for the United States and pray for the world. And we want to pray for the uh, uh, climate that we live in now, the social climate that we're living in. Pray for our upcoming elections, and we want to encourage you to go vote. We don't try to influence you how you vote. It's your vote. It's your pick. It's your choice. It's a constitutional right, but we do encourage you to vote. Uh, typically, uh, Christians and folks that attend church regularly do not vote in that high of numbers. So we encourage you to go vote. Vote prayerfully. Vote prayerfully and scripturally, and certainly as you feel, vote, uh, but, but please let the River Bend be well represented at the voting uh, uh, house. Uh, we want to pray right now before we get started. I ask that the Lord will bless this service, this time together. I feel like I have a word from the Lord. Uh, I didn't see it coming the way that it is, but uh, the Lord certainly has a plan for us. So let's pray over these requests right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, over the members of the River Bend, the friends of the River Bend who are watching with us, and, uh, all that are affected by this virus, this pandemic. I, I pray, God, that quick healing will come. I pray that power will be manifest in each life. I pray for our surrounding area and the city of New Madrid and all the surrounding communities that have been heavily affected by this virus. Uh, I pray, God, that for those that are in the hospital, that they'll soon uh, be well and come home. I pray for the workers at the hospital that are under heavy stress, the health departments, the nurses, the doctors, uh, the support staff. I pray, God, for everyone that is helping to fight this battle as we face another wave of this virus. Uh, I pray, God, for our country. I pray for the United States of America, a country founded on biblical principles, a country that our forefathers' speeches were filled with scripture and biblical references as they use the Bible as the motivation and as the guide for the government of this country. I pray for our upcoming election. I pray that our people care enough to get out and vote. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we'll vote prayerfully and vote scripturally and, and vote in accord with our convictions and our beliefs. And I pray that we get out. I pray, God, you'll bless this time together today. I pray that you'll bless it. Let it be a, a word of encouragement. Let it be a word of awakening. Let the revelation and the power of the Holy Ghost flow through us uh, into the hearts, minds, and lives uh, of those that are watching. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you again for your giving, for your continued giving during this pandemic. Uh, 
I want to remind you that uh, today, obviously, we won't be passing the offering plate, but I want uh, uh, to remind you that uh, uh, we can give on Givelify. That's the giving app. Go to Givelify and type in Riverbend Pentecostals. It'll lead you to give uh, to our church, whether it be tithing, offerings, special offerings, etc. I want to remind you that we have PayPal, which is through our website. And my wife informed me this morning that I haven't been given our website address. So it is Riverbend Pentecostals, one word, dot com. And uh, you can give through PayPal. Then, of course, you can mail it to our post office box, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. And then if you'd like us to come pick it up, what I've been doing is when people call me, I just ask them to put it in their mailbox and I go immediately to pick it up. It's been happening. And uh, I uh, also have had some leave it here. So if you'd like to come leave it in our mailbox, uh, uh, we'd uh, be happy to receive it that way. Well, we've got to keep giving. You've always been faithful to give, and we thank you for that. We're going to go to the Word of the Lord this morning, and uh, I, uh, I have to be honest with you. I was seeking the Lord for a different message. Uh, I got the Word, but He led me to a different place, and I want to to speak a word of awareness to us this morning. Uh, the church is put here for a purpose. And in Matthew 16, he said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church has got to realize we do not have to defend ourselves. The destiny of the church is assured. Hell will not destroy the church. We cannot spend time, effort, energy, resources, etc., trying to win a battle that's already won. The church will stand, but the church has to be the church. And I'm calling us this morning to an awareness of who we are, that we are a chosen generation. We are planted into this world and this nation for such a time as this. And, and I want to uh, strongly ask that you that you listen to this message as it's live, and then perhaps go back and watch it again as we have to have a daily awareness, a daily awareness of who we are and who God wants us to be, who has placed us here to effect. He is, we, we are called a, not of the world, but we're of the Lord. We're, we're not of uh, the things of the world, but we're the things of God. We are not earthly, but heavenly, as it were, with our motivation and with our influences and I, I really feel a, a strong unction to share this word with us this morning. We are in perilous times, of that there's no doubt. I'm not speaking of this pandemic. Now, this pandemic is real. It is serious. It's not fake. It's not been uh, uh, raised up by politicians. People are really sick. People really die. People are really being affected. It is not fake. But it isn't the most serious thing we're facing right now. It is not even the worst thing our country's ever seen before. We've come through worse than this. Our grandparents and our great-grandparents endured worse than this, and they survived, and we will too. But there's another force that carries with it a far heavier weight of consequence than this pandemic. We cannot completely control this virus. We can do wash our hands, use hand sanitizer, wear face masks, say, stay socially distant, but the truth is we cannot completely control this virus. We can't see it. It's a hidden enemy. The doctors and scientists don't even know that much about it, relatively speaking. It affects everyone differently. Politicians don't know very much about it other than what the doctors tell them, and then they tell us what they want us to hear. But uh, we can't control this pandemic. At the end of the day, we can't control it. We can try to restrain it, but we can't control it. But the greater enemy, a stronger enemy, a greater threat has come against us. And I want us to let you know this morning, we can completely control this enemy. As I prayed for a word from God, walking around, I, as you know, my family and I have been under quarantine and I have a track in the, in the park behind my house. And fortunately, I've only met one person while I've been out there walking. So I've been able to quarantine at the walking track. And that's my prayer time as I've told our people many times before. And so I began to pray as I was walking and, and uh, seeking the Lord and asking the Lord for a word to increase the faith of our people and to make us stronger in our faith and our hope and our belief and trust in God. 
And the Lord led me to that exact scripture, Luke 17 and 5. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. I thought, my goodness, that's it. That's it. That's the title of my message today, Increase Our Faith. Have you ever had a time when you felt like your faith wasn't sufficient to survive or overcome a particular circumstance or obstacle? When the mountain seemed too tall or the valley too deep or the river too wide, when life dealt you a blow that it seemed this will be the one that's going to take me out, when a time when your faith seemed so insufficient, just quite not enough. The disciples of Jesus Christ find themselves in such a place, or at least they think they are. The teaching of Jesus has brought them, as we have mentioned to you uh, several times in the last few months, the teaching of Jesus Christ has brought the disciples to a place of tension, a place where they have to make a decision between staying like they are and moving further. And anytime you hear a word from the Lord, it'll bring a, a tension to you where uh, there's, a, there's a make or break moment where you surrender yourself to the word of God or you go back to where you were and have to start all over again. They think in their own estimation, without increased faith, they cannot align themselves with what Jesus has declared unto them. Now, when reading the gospels and the stories in the gospels and the stories of the things Jesus and his disciples are faced with, uh, one might begin to put any number of faces to what it is the disciples see here in Luke 17 when they say, Lord, increase our faith. Uh, let's read uh, the first five verses ending with our text. And let's see what this seemingly insurmountable obstacle was. This thing that the Lord has brought to their attention that their first response is, we've got to have greater faith. Then said he unto his disciples, this is Luke 17 and 1, it is impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. Verse number three, he shifts course a little. It says, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespassed against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turned to thee again, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles' response, the apostles responded to the Lord telling them this by saying, Lord, increase our faith. So it's in fact not one obstacle, but two areas that the disciples quickly see a need for greater faith uh, in order to accomplish it, in order to uh, do this in order to align themselves with Jesus' teaching. There's two obstacles. Jesus speaks here of offending and of being offended. First, he warns, he says, offenses will come, but it is of utmost importance that they don't come from you. He clearly says, woe will come to those that offend, and if that isn't enough, he then says, you'd be better off trying to survive being thrown into the sea with a heavy millstone. That's a that's a stone about, about this big and about, about two to three feet tall, perhaps a foot wide, weighs several hundred pounds, a uh, millstone. Uh, he said, you'd be better off to have one of them tied around your neck and be thrown into the sea than to try to survive what's going to come if you offend people. Secondly, he warns of how to respond to one who trespasses against you sins against you or offends you. And understand, this is not a perceived offense. This is actually somebody does you wrong. Somebody offends you, but there's a proper way to respond. He says, if when they're rebuked for doing wrong, when they're made aware that they've done you wrong, that they ask you to forgive them, you have to forgive them. And if he does it seven times in a day and asks you to forgive him seven times in a day, Jesus says very clearly, thou shalt forgive him. In this case, as often is the case when Jesus teaches, seven isn't a hard or literal number here. When he says forgive them seven times or ask forgiveness seven times, he's not saying that on number eight, you don't have to obey this. But seven is a, a, a symbol of infinity. So in this case, it is infinite forgiveness that has to be offered. 
As soon as Jesus offers this teaching to his disciples, they declare, increase our faith. So in short, here's what they're saying. If you want us to live lives where we don't offend and to where we're continually forgiving people, no matter how often they offend us and ask forgiveness, you're going to have to give us faith to do it. You're going to have to give us what we need to do that. We can't do that without you. And Jesus declares to them, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, faith has the power over the powerless. If you speak to this sycamine tree, be plucked up by the roots. He said, if you speak to this tree and say, be plucked up by the roots and then be planted into the sea, it should obey you. That is if you have faith as of a grain of mustard seed. Increased faith is what they were asking for, but increased faith wasn't what they needed. That was not the answer. They wanted Jesus to make them into uh, men that could be obedient to his word, and he declares to them in no uncertain terms that obedience to his word would result in increased faith. The disciples wanted to do what the Lord said, but they felt like they had to have supernatural help to do that. And the Lord tells them very plainly, do it, and it leads to increased faith. They were asking for the supernatural power of God to overcome their own weakness. They didn't need increased faith. They needed an increased awareness of who they were and who Jesus was. There was within them a desire to do what Jesus said, but they wanted him to make them do it. He was, in the principles and precepts of his word, giving them the key to what they wanted and what they needed, which is submission to the word of God. In the world that we live now, and first I'm going to ask you to forgive me if, uh, if uh, current events and uh, current circumstances, uh, if me speaking directly to them, uh, is, is a little bit disconcerting for you, but I feel like the Lord wants to lead us here because of uh, every discussion in the world in which we live right now, and I believe it has increased during this time of pandemic, but every discussion has become an opportunity for contention. Social media has become a breeding ground for both offending and being offended. Everything from the outhouse to the White House is an opportunity to be offended or to offend. I thought today I started to do it and change my mind, but I thought of how many long, drawn-out, thoughtful arguments people have had over wearing a mask or not. I got to be honest with you. It's not that big a deal to me. It's not that big a deal. I don't like it. I don't want to do it. not happy about doing it. But if I'm asked to do it, I do it with no questions asked. And if it starts being a problem for me, you know what I do? I excuse myself. I go to my truck and take it off. Everything has become a bone of contention. Everything has become an opportunity for people to be offended. That cannot be the case in the church of the living God. Jesus said, don't be the offender. Jesus said, forgive the offender, and you don't, oh, I'm starting to feel the Holy Ghost right now, you don't need greater faith to do it. When we submit ourselves to and obey the word of God, then our faith is increased. He gave them the word of God. They didn't have to pray about it, think about it, dwell on it, consider it, see how it fit their life. The Lord gave it to them. It is a precept given by God. Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. You don't need greater faith when you have a word from God. You don't need greater faith. But our faith is increased as we submit ourselves further and more to the leading of the word. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. We need to have our faith revived, not in the words of politicians, lawyers, and judges, both those elected, those official, and those that are self-appointed, that are on our friends list, 
But we have to have a revival of faith in the word of God. When the Lord tells us something, it is settled. It is not debated. It is not open for discussion. It is settled. We have got to pray, submit ourselves to the word of God until that desire, that spirit of dissension has no effect on us. It is not on us. That spirit of contention. You do not have to defend yourself when you're aligned with the word of God. It doesn't have to happen. Offenses will come, but we got to learn to handle them in the way of the Lord. It is the way of the Lord that our faith will be increased. The greatest obstacle we're facing is not this pandemic, but it's a people divided. It's a people divided to the point, hear me now, it's a people divided to the point because, let me see if I can make this illustration, because first it's divided into two groups. And then those two groups are divided into four groups and then four groups into eight groups. And before you know it, you have you are alienated from and alienated to everybody. And now we're alone and we're by ourselves and we weren't created to be that way. But we were created as the body of Christ. The church was created to to. Uh, assemble ourselves together and gain strength from testifying to one another and witnessing to one another, praying for one another. We need one another, but the spirit has crept in to our, the very fiber of our community of who we are that says we have to disagree with everything, but the word of the Lord says that's not how you handle it. The word of the Lord says don't offend people, and I'm not talking about you understand what I'm talking about. Don't offend. Don't disagree just for the sake of disagreeing. Don't disagree just for the sake of being on the opposite side of somebody. But let's look for common ground to come together as the people of God. This is not necessarily talking to our world, but it has given the church the authority and the power and the avenue whereby we can be a light into this world of direction and of hope and not division. But it's in the church you can be saved. It's in the house of God you can be safe. It is under the umbrella of the Spirit that you can be safe. We've got to be a, have a place that's safe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. He would not have offered that if there wasn't a need to be safe. And the church has got to be that, not just for the saint, but also for the sinner, not just for the believer, but also for the unbeliever. We've got to create an atmosphere where everybody can come and be safe. They're not going to be connected to God when they're on an island all by themselves. It is the will of the enemy that we be divided. He cometh not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. And I'm telling you, we're better together. I'm not saying that we, that we violate everything that separates us. I'm not saying we violate the law of God, but I'm saying that if we violate behave ourselves as the Lord wants us to behave ourselves, then you'll find favor with God and man. The word of the Lord is very clear that we are to occupy until he comes. The word of the Lord is very clear and he has given us everything we need for salvation, to, for life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. The church has got to be the light of the light for a world that is lost. The way of God is foolish. Why is there? I, I can't answer this except it's the, the and I've, I've been doing a little studying about the God of the world, but there is a God of the world. But why is it that we can read something on social media and an anger, a, a desire for vindication will rise up in us? And we don't even know them people. The truth is we don't even know who's right or who's wrong in their statement necessarily, but there, there's a spiritual that rises up in us to fight. That doesn't come from God. That does not come from the Lord. We've got to have the peace and the confidence that comes from him that we know we're lining ourselves with his word, and that's all I have to do. Submit yourself, therefore, to God that he may exalt you in due time. The church needs to pray. The church needs to forgive and be forgiven. The church needs to come together. Beware of the spirit of Antichrist because it's already in the world. Beware of the spirit of mishandled offenses, both giving and receiving. The avenue whereby our faith will be increased is through obedience to the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Build your house on a rock by hearing and doing the word. 
You build it on the sand by hearing the word and doing your own thing. Offenses are going to come. They're always, they've always been here. They're always going to be here. There's a confidence that comes from the Spirit. Jesus used the example. He said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but here in Luke number chapter number 17, he says, uh, so you have a landowner, you have a servant. And the servant goes out and works hard all day long. And then he comes into the house. He said, the landowner doesn't tell the servant, sit down at the table and let me serve you since you've worked so hard. But the servant comes in and then puts on an apron and puts on, washes his hands and puts on an apron and he serves the master of the house. Here's the thing. Just because we've been good in one thing doesn't give us a right to be bad in another. Just because we've worked hard in one area doesn't allow us to coast in another. But we have to align ourselves completely with the word of God. We have to align ourselves completely. He said, woe to them through whom offenses come. You have a better chance of winning a fight with a millstone in the sea than you do of continuing to be offensive. We cannot be. We got to line ourselves with the word of God. Please hear me right now. There is such a, uh, we're not a bunch of snowflakes. We're not a bunch of pushovers. You don't have to allow people to mistreat you. That's not what the Bible is saying. What the Bible is saying is we do not have to get on board this carousel of uh, destruction that whose greatest weapon is division and realize that the church, the church is the vehicle through which Jesus Christ manifest himself in the world. We cannot be a part of the problem. We've got to be a part of the solution. We cannot be a part of continued uh, derision and division and belittling. And, and uh, I've told you about Proverbs 18 and 2 and, and the English Standard Version really ministered to me. It said, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. I have got to, uh, by the grace of God, pray that my opinions aren't uh, knee-jerk opinions, that my opinions aren't based upon somebody else. I, I don't have reactive opinions, but I have proactive opinions that are settled in the Word of God, and that my mind and my thought and my words align with His. Church, we are in on the precipice of an unbelievable revival. I was having a conversation with a, a local minister this past week, and he said that he believed that the great awakening, another great awakening was upon us. And I say that with also this emphasis that there's going to be a great awakening, but it's going to be a great awakening of people that are hungry for truth, absolute truth. The truth is, you and I don't know what's going on in Washington. You and I don't know what's going on in New York or California or, or any of these other hotbeds of controversy, but we do know what's going on in the Word of God, and we do know what's going on in the Spirit, and the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. We have got to be the church. We've got to be salt. We've got to be light. We've got to be truth. We cannot be a part of the problem but we have to become part of the solution. We can only do that through Jesus Christ. And the avenue whereby we do it is obedience to his word. We cannot be the reason somebody doesn't live for God because we had to share our opinion and we had to share it forcefully. Opinions are like noses, Brother Tenney said. Everybody's got one and they all stink. But there's something that's settled. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. I can't, I have a, a preference over who I would like to win the election. I have a preference over who I would like to be in control, but I'm not in control. I don't get to decide that in the, in the greatest sense, but the Lord sets kings up and takes them down. He sets authorities up and takes them down. I have to make sure I'm aligned with the Lord because he's the one that's truly in control. He's the one that has all power in heaven and earth, not me. Not you, but the Lord. And his word is the vehicle by which he speaks into my life. And i got to align myself with his word. Thank you for joining us today. I uh, had a clear word. been looking at my clock, making sure I go long enough to live up to my reputation. 
But uh, I want you to know I had a clear word for you today. It's the word of God. It's what the word desires for us. I'm going to ask you to pray with me right now. I'm going to ask you to pray specifically with me right now. That that Please understand, this is not G.L. King that you're trying to align yourself with. This is Jesus Christ that we're trying to align ourselves with. And we have got to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. And the problem is everybody doesn't trust each other. Everybody doesn't want to stand on the same place, but we can come together around the word of God. I told our people the other day, a couple of services ago, when we were still in service, we do not want to change the Lord to suit us but we want to be changed to suit him. And, and we will be unified when we come around a cause. And the cause is we want the will of God to be done. We want people to be saved. We want people to be forgiven of their sins, baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. We want the power of God to be manifest uh, all, all through the week, not just at church all through the week. That's how it's supposed to be through us. But we can't do that if we're distracted. We can't do that if we're uh, getting ourselves involved in discussions that have no benefit, have no end. I promise you, you're not going to change anybody's mind by getting on social media and lambasting what they think. But you can through the restraining confidence of the power of God make a difference in this world. Let's be the church. The church that's built on a rock. The church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for bringing us together today. I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, that I don't have to pray, Lord, increase my faith so I can survive in this time. I've got to just go back to the word of God that's forever settled. Yes, we're in opposition. Yes, we're in troublesome times. Yes, we have people that, that are looking for answers and looking for solutions, but it, the only answer is Jesus Christ. The only answer is a relationship with you. We've got to learn to pray. We've got to learn to fast. We've got to learn to seek your face. We've got to stop looking for answers in all the wrong places. Let the church be the church. Let us be a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Let us, Lord, realize we don't have to validate ourselves. We don't have to, to affirm ourselves, but you do that for us. But it's not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, saith the Lord. Thank you for this day, for this opportunity. Thank you for everyone that joined with us. I pray you'll bring us back together very soon because we do need each other. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.